sort of work. The trousers were slightly better and less creased than they were before. But there was a further problem. That was around the time, 1960, when artificial fibres were becoming more common. So you wore trousers that were smooth anyway and had a permanent crease in the front. So his trouser press also didn't catch on in a big way, although I believe about 10,000 trouser presses sell each year. So there must be some people who like old-fashioned fashion worsted wool. Uh, so there is a, still a bit of a demand. But the point about uh, Peter Corbett Jr. and Sr. is they didn't work in a vast research lab inventing trouser presses. They worked in a shed, a shed at the bottom of the garden. They were shed inventors. Now, another shed inventor is a man called George Cowardine. He worked for Ford uh, in the suspension department, uh, working out car suspension. He learned all about springs and pulleys and things. Then in his shed, back in the evenings, what he invented was something genuinely useful. The angle poise light, all invented in a shed uh, by somebody who had worked on cars. Another of these stories, uh, one day, I think you probably know this story, uh, one day, many years ago, uh, a man called Percy Shaw was driving along the A647 in the West Riding of Yorkshire. It was night. And suddenly a cat uh, came up into the road and stared into the headlights, and the eyes were very, very bright. And Percy Shaw went back to his shed and bent his cat's eyes. He knew that one. Uh, Ken Dodd had a somewhat crude uh, joke on that. He said, if the cat had been facing the other way, Percy Shaw would have invented a pencil sharpener, you know that one. <laughs> uh, you, know, you can now forget that one. That one very good. Uh, anyway, uh, so that was Percy Shaw. He invented the cat's eyes. Again, in his shed. He did it in his shed. Now, some of you may remember when the A1 through Hertfordshire uh, was single carriageway. Can you remember that? A permanent traffic jam. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to have to drive it every week. Uh, and there was a pub at one of the roundabouts called the Comet. And that commemorated the first aeroplane that used a jet engine. And the man who invented the jet engine was Sir Frank Whittle. Sir Frank Whittle. Uh, and again, he invented all, he did all the drawings. Uh, he didn't actually make one, but he did all the drawings in a shed. It was invented in a shed. Actually, he then did have a research lab in Cambridge. There's a, one of those blue plaques showing where Frank Whittle then developed the jet engine. But he thought of it in a shed. Now, the worst uh, journey I've ever had, I think, was on a hovercraft uh, crossing the channel. Did anybody take the hovercraft across the channel? They, absolutely horrible. I felt sick for days. Uh, and who, do anyone know who invented the hovercraft in the shed? He had a small one in a kind of tub. A man called Christopher Cockrell. Uh, he invented the hovercraft. But my, famous, my favourite of these stories uh, is of a man called Trevor Bayliss. Not to be confused with Trevor Bailey, the great batsman. Uh, Trevor Bayliss was watching a, uh, a television programme in the early 1990s about AIDS in Africa. And the message was he needed to get public health warnings to people in remote parts of Africa to stop the disease spreading. Uh, but nobody had radios in those remote parts, they couldn't, didn't have electricity, and they couldn't afford batteries. So he had the bright idea of a... A clockwork radio, exactly. And he went off to his shed, and he invented it with no Roberts radio in half an hour. It was that quick. And it did save many lives. Now, I like to think, in Nazareth, in the back of the house, there was a large shed uh, where Joseph, uh, helped by Jesus, made good, solid, no-nonsense, built-to-last kind of furniture. Uh, nothing fancy. <clears throat> and then there was a smaller shed where Jesus invented... Well, what did he invent? Uh, he didn't invent the Gospel. He was the Gospel. So nothing to invent there. Uh, he was the incarnation of God, destined to, be, to die on the cross and to rise again. He was that person. He didn't need to invent it. But what he did invent was the ways he would convey that in words to people who came to hear him. Uh, and that invention was the comet uh, to the power of ten to the power of ten. It was a superb invention. The human ways in which Jesus invented to convey the Gospel. Now we had a moment ago uh, the Beatitudes, all very familiar, but what the Sermon on the Mount tells us is Jesus was an absolutely superb speech maker. His rhetoric was beyond compare, uh, and he uses common rhetorical techniques, but extremely well. So, for example, uh, I didn't need to work the Bible, the first uh, Beatitude 
is blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven. Now just think what that what he's saying there. It's a wonderful paradox. He's saying, uh, normally we think it's rich people who own things, but here he's saying it's the poor that own the thing that really matters, namely the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to them. Now imagine hearing that for the first time, not having learned it at school in divinity classes, but hearing it for the first time on the mount. This extraordinary paradox that actually the most valuable thing of all will be owned by the poor. They're all paradoxes, and then you get to the last one, which is and then again, an astonishing paradox. He says, Blessed, happy are you, happy are you, if you are persecuted and reviled for my sake. Well, that's not our normal way of thinking about happiness, to be reviled. But here he is saying, You will be blessed, you'll be happy if you suffer that. So he was using paradox to the most superb effect, and repetition, of course, that's the other thing he was doing. He was repeating the same things, same structure in each sentence. So it must have been hugely powerful. And then the rest of the Sermon of the Mount, uh, he uses another rhetorical technique of contrast or even contradiction. He says, you heard it said, but I say. Now again, imagine yourself hearing that for the first time. Though it's about you, you come to hear this extraordinary man you've heard about, you want to hear him preach. And then he says, you heard it said, but I say. And lots and lots of different things. At first, you'd, you'd say, well, how dare he say this? How dare he contradict what I believe, my traditional beliefs? But then he goes on, and it becomes more and more convincing. The cumulative effect means that by the end, if you were listening uh, to that Sermon on the Mount, you would be overwhelmed by the sense that the whole world is being upended uh, by the Gospel. The, the force, uh, the rhetorical force, must have been mind-blowing for the people who first heard the Sermon on the Mount. So that's one thing he did. He was a superb speech maker. Absolutely superb. Think of other fine speeches. Think of Martin Luther King, the I Have a Dream speech. Or even the fictional speech uh, of Mark Antony, my friends are over in the country from that one. Uh, I come not to bury Caesar, but to praise him, Mark Antony, in Julius Caesar. Those are great speeches. But actually, if you think of Martin Luther King's speech, is he uses repetition, I have a dream, which he repeats a number of times. But it's a one-dimensional speech, whereas Jesus' rhetoric goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Martin Luther King is the same, one dimension. If you think of Mark Antony's speech, it is, of course, brilliant as a speech. Shakespeare wrote it, and everything Shakespeare wrote was really brilliant. Uh, but as a speech, you don't feel uplifted by it, as you imagine yourself listening to it. What you actually feel is Mark Antony is manipulating you, and that's just what he was doing. Uh, so it actually doesn't come over at the end as a good speech, it's a manipulative speech. So that's one thing about the rhetorical techniques of our Lord. Uh, another one is stories. Uh, I looked up in the internet, it says that Jesus told 37 parables. Uh, I didn't, I mean, there are some things which what's a parable and what's a say. But anyway, there are a lot of parables, full of stories, full of earthly stories with heavenly meanings, as we used to get taught. Uh, and they are stunning. And the reason why we know, they, we know they're stunning is we remember them. I suspect if after this service we gathered round a table and tried to think of 37 parables, we do it in about three minutes. We know them, they're inside us, they're in our DNA. That's how they work. Now I can think of only two non-Jesus parables that I think are remotely comparable. And they're both Hans Christian Andersen, the ugly duckling, and the imprisoned clothes. They are fantastic parables, wonderful. But then I discovered that one of them, the Emperor's New Clothes, wasn't invented by Hans Christian Andersen at all. Uh, it's a Spanish folk tale. So there we are. So I don't think he does uh, much work there. So in terms of sheer skill at speaking and uh, relating the gospel, uh, Jesus is absolutely beyond compare. Now you might say none of that matters. After all, the gospel would have happened, Jesus would have happened, even if God had decided he should be a hesitant speaker, not a good speaker, not a teller of great stories, the gospel would still have been there. We're talking not about the divine Christ, but about the human Christ. So maybe it doesn't matter. But I think it does matter that we understand this for two reasons, and they're both to do with evangelism. One is uh, confidence. We Christians are often thought to be boring, dull, unintellectual, mediocre, and so on. That's a typical way in which we regard. 
Well, you and I may be like that. We may be mediocre. But our leader is definitely not. He is unsurpassed and unsurpassable in purely human terms, let alone in divine terms. And if we recognize that and are willing to say that, that actually gives confidence to what we're saying. And that leads to the much deeper reason. Uh, it would be odd if Jesus, if God, in bringing his son to earth, had bring, brought him with a mediocre sort of ability. That would have been odd. The fact that Jesus is so superlative in his preaching gives plausibility to his content. People will sit up and listen. And once people begin to think the gospel is plausible, then it's only a matter of time before they become believers.